First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Kenishida for inviting me. I'm humbled and I'm honored to be here and I want to congratulate him on putting together a superb meeting. This is my uh, financial disclosure. For Abbott Medical Optics, I have no financial interest in the genetics of current Um And my work has been supported by the NEI, IT Fix Research Foundation. I want to acknowledge my collaborators. Dr. Jerome Rado is head of medical genetics at Cedar Sinai, uh, Hu Ying Yang, Xiao Yi Li, George Tang Lane, Abbott Kaskova, Ken Taylor, Alex Limov, Stephen Wilson, Anthony L. Darby, Graham Wister, and John, Li Zhong Dong. Um, without these people, there's no way that I could do this work because I'm basically a clinician. <coughs> so let's talk about the challenges in defining the genetic basis of keratoconus. Um, the first challenge is um, heterogeneity. As you know, keratoconus has been reported in association with many different diseases. Um, so when you want to define the genetic basis for keratoconus, it's critical to exclude these associations because you need to deal with a clean disease. Study only clean keratoconus cases with no other associations. And in this way, you can exclude heterogeneity. For example, a patient has keratoconus only probably has a very different genetic basis than someone who has keratoconus with labors or Down syndrome. Um, the second challenge is the definition of keratoconus. And the, for genetic purposes, there are three kinds of keratoconus. Clinically obvious keratoconus, where you can make a slit lamp diagnosis. Early keratoconus, there was no slit lamp finding, but positive red elimination findings, just typical topography. And form thrust keratoconus, we have no slit lamp findings, but just atypical topography. Now, if you look at video keratography, uh, it's uh, a little bit more helpful. Here you can see in uh, typical topography without any clinical signs. Here you have typical topography with no clinical signs, but just scissoring and retinoscopy, and here's obvious keratoconus. Uh, Mark Amsler was the first uh, to talk about uh, the early detection of keratoconus. And he described the early topographic changes prior to clinical signs. He used a very crude Placido disc, which showed a 1 to 4 degree deviation, and he called that keratoconus thrust. 4 to 8 degree deviation, he labeled early or mild keratoconus. He studied 286 eyes for 3 to 8 years, and 20% of the entire group, but 66% of this early group, progressed. And here is his crude Placido disc. <coughs> So we wanted to, to kind of mimic some of the of genetic bases before we try to study the genetics of disease. And the first thing we did is we looked at the presence of absence disease just using clinical disease. And uh, we used qualitative traits, which is corneal thinning, Vogue-Strea, INI, obvious scissoring. And we looked at 1,593 individuals from 240 families where there were five or more, four, five or more members per family. And you can see here that when you look at this, environment was rejected, no major gene rejected, but major gene and recessive was not rejected. And this is when you look at clinical traits only, people with clinically obvious disease. So when you take in the quantitative traits, you can do another analysis using this KIS percent, percentage index. And you can see when you look at that, what was not rejected was major gene recessive and dominant. These all others were rejected. So what this tells you is that there is a genetic basis that can be recessive, uh, or dominant, but it can be a complex interaction with environmental factors. So is the evidence for genetic based in keratoconus? Yes. Segregation studies demonstrate this. This was published in the Journal of Medical Genetics. Other causes such as environmental factors may contribute to the expression of disease, but by themselves are not the major cause of keratoconus. There's not a single published scientific study that supports that keratoconus can be caused by eye rubbing only. But I do believe that eye rubbing can aggravate keratoconus in genetically susceptible individuals. So, once we've done the segregation analysis, let's go on to molecular genetic studies. We've done gene expression studies, linkage analyses, genome-wide association studies, and we've looked at some candidate genes, and I'm going to walk you through the, all three of these, all four of these, very carefully. Um, with gene expression studies, what you try to do is you try to identify genes in the cornea and compare disease with normal corneas, and this may allow for therapy by increasing or suppressing a gene in the future. And uh, with Graham Wister at the NEI, we looked, I supplied him with about seven corneal keratoconus buttons, and using several techniques, he came up with a library where we showed 4,109 clones, each potentially representing individual genes. This is the single largest library of corneal genes constructed ever, and the complete library can be viewed at the NEI website at neibank.nihnih.gov. 
If you have a look here, this is the way it's listed. You get the name of the gene, you can get the JMEC number, you can get the Unicode number, and you can see the number of clones. And this is very useful when you want to compare expression of keratoconus versus normals or other diseases. Um, here, we just took a sampling of some of the genes, and we showed that apoptosis genes is very much increased in keratoconus, and this supports some of the studies I did with Steve Wilson and King, which showed that there was a significant increase in apoptosis in patients with keratoconus. So now there's a molecular basis to support that. We also showed that acroporin-5 was suppressed in patients with keratoconus. Um, as you know, acroporin-5 is a water transport gene, but also plays a major role in wound healing. Here are some epithelium that we studied. You can see here's normals in acroporin-5 and here's keratoconus. You can see ESX is a, is a uh, marker, a normal uh, control, and you can see the ESX is available in all the specimens. The acroporin-5 presently normals, but absent in the keratoconus buttons. <coughs> We try to explore this a little bit further, but unfortunately these studies have been disappointing in that biology of acroporin-5 is not very well understood. We didn't <coughs> identify any mutations in acroporin-5, uh, but it does suggest there's a normal wound healing in the keratoconus epithelium. Um, gene expression studies have also been done by others, and lysyl oxidase, acroporin-5, and other genes are virtually expressed in keratoconus epithelium. So there are clear abnormalities in the corneal epithelium of keratoconus. And previously, there have been reports of anatomical and biochemical abnormalities in the epithelium, and now they're genetic abnormalities, suggesting that there may be a signal for a disease which may start in the epithelium and go down in the stromal, or maybe the other way around, with the stromal disease sends a signal upwards. So I think this is an interesting area for future exploration. But what about linkage analysis? We did a large autosomal dominant family, and we found a region on chromosome 5, 5, Q, 14, 14, Q, 21, the large score 3.53, and this was replicated by an Italian group by Basiglia et al. Um, we also did sub-pair sub analysis, where we did a similar analysis with sub pairs, and here's the several the low chi and low side that we identified, and you can see the different genes all along the human genome that may be interesting in keratoconus. This is a synopsis of all the linkage sites uh, that have been identified so far for keratoconus. You can see every year they're increasing, and it's scattered all over the human genome. And what's interesting is that there are several areas which overlap. Number five, three studies, and number 14, two studies, three studies. So these areas need to be looked at a little bit more carefully. Um, I'd just like to mention the VSX1 gene, which was uh, reported by Heon as contributing to keratoconus. We looked at the Tony Aldavi at UCLA, we looked at over 200 patients who were unable to find any disease-causing mutations in VSX1, so we've kind of dismissed this as the causative gene for keratoconus. Uh, so in summary, when you look at linkage analysis, there are multiple loci of the genome. Not surprising, because it's highly likely that many genes contribute to the development of keratoconus. Identified regions need to be carefully followed up to identify mutations in genes that are along the biological pathway and the pathogens of keratoconus. And genome-wide association studies We'll all find low side identified genes or genetic variants predisposing to keratoconus. So what are genome-wide association studies? A genome-wide association study is an approach that involves rapidly scanning markers across the whole human genome of many individuals to find genetic variants associated with the disease. This was made possible by the completion of the Human Genome Project and the International HAPMAC Project, and it provided a set of research tools that could quickly analyze whole genome samples for genetic variations. This approach was used to identify complements being associated with macular degeneration. Well, we just completed the largest study ever on keratoconus using genome-wide association. We looked at 244 Ks in the field with 3,324 normal controls. Uh, and we did a confirmation study of 304 Ks for 5 and 18 controls, as well as a family panel of 312 subjects in 70 families. We identified three steps which reached genome-wide association. Fine mapping of independent case control samples confirmed the top two regions. Unfortunately, I can't tell you what they are because I've submitted this to Argo, so all this information will be presented at Argo, and this will probably be a 10-15 minute presentation, the detailed analysis. But it will be out coming out soon. Um, the other thing that GWAS allows you to do is it allows you to look at, do a biological pathway analysis. So what you do is you look at an overload of genes belonging to the same biological pathway, and by doing an analysis using a computer program called David, you can try and figure out what pathways may be involved in the disease process. And you have, for example, the uh, extracellular matrix pathway, there's a bunch of genes, there's a bunch of genes going the calcium binding pathway, and then you look at the collagen pathway, which is really of great interest to us. So how do we now uh, do follow-up studies once we've identified regions? How would you decide which genes are good candidate genes? You look at the gene in the area, and we look at our GWAS samples, if yes, if it's in sample one, 
We give it one point in sample two, two points, divergent expression three points, reported literature four, and biological five. So that would be a top rank gene. If we had something ahead of all five of those, that would be number one, number two, three, four. That's how we decide the order for follow up studies. So the one gene that's really interesting is lysyl oxidase. Lysyl oxidase, as you know, is involved in collagen cross linking in the cornea. It's the main enzyme that causes collagen cross linking in the cornea. And this is located at 5Q23.2. It was associated in our first association sample, in our second one. We showed differential expression in the cornea, and others have done the same. It's been reported in the literature as maybe associated with keratoconus, which has an important biological function, as we mentioned, uh, the kind of corneal collagen cross linking. So, common locks variants lead to increased susceptibility to developing KC. We've done linkage uh, disequilibrium studies, uh, which we reported previously at Arbor in 2008. And now both our GWAS and confirmation panels show <coughs> that there are genetic variants associated with keratoconus. Again, the detailed results will be presented at Arbor. This is a 10 minute talk on its own, and you'll look at the data and decide whether you feel this data is real. I think this data is very real. What's very interesting is that we are getting different uh, uh, associates with different introns of the same gene associated with keratoconus. So in summary, video keratography has played an important role in early detection of keratoconus, which is critical for genetic studies. Segregation analysis in the families have suggested genes play a major role in development of keratoconus. Gene expression studies, linkage analysis, and genome-wide associates have provided points of genetic loci which have to be further refined to before genes that contribute to development in keratoconus. One such gene, lysyl oxidase, which is responsible for collagen crossing in the cornea, is associated with keratoconus and its role needs to be more clearly defined. It may have therapeutic implications. Once the role of these genes have been clearly identified to study, we'll develop a better understanding of the pathogenesis and develop better therapies to prevent its progression. I'd like to thank you very much. Once again, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. I'm honored and I'm humbled, and thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, we'll have a discussion time later. So we'll move to uh, <coughs> our uh, presentation.